All right, welcome to Monday Night Bible Study. Perhaps the first time I've had the opportunity to teach while Craig is here. <laughs> Normally it's a Craig Campbell Appreciation Night. I mean, it's every night really is. Uh, but he is here, and uh, he did clean up, clean up the room and set up the table and make the coffee and get the pizza and pay for the pizza and bring the drinks and set up the Mevo and set up the Zoom and uh, put the pulpit in place and open my Bible to the book of Jude. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, start right here. <clears throat> so that's where I'm going to start. I draw the line, though, at feeding the feeding you the gummies. That's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> Man's got to know his limits. <laughs> um, good. We are going to go through the letter of Jude, the book right before Revelation. Just one chapter, so that makes it simple. Anybody know uh, synonyms for the proper name Jude? Any other uh, spellings? Judas. Judas. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. Of course, you always you think of Judas Iscariot, right, when you think of Judas. And so I'm not sure if that's why they chose Jude instead of Judas, but he does have the same name. And, and uh, Judah. Interestingly, yeah, it, it does mean Judah. And so this Judas is writing about apostasy. And interestingly, the other famous Judas was the most famous apostate. <laughs> um, so that's a neat factor. His introduction here, he calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. Uh, do you know any other relationship that he has to Jesus Christ? Anybody? Brother? Half-brother. Mm -hmm. Why is he just his half-brother? Different fathers? <laughs> that's right. And that's kind of a big deal. So they, they could only have the same mother um, because, because what happens what? Uh, with the father? What's, re what's the earthly father responsible for? Passing on sin nature. See of the man. Uh, the sin nature is, is passed on. And so the immaculate conception Jesus, he had a mother, which was a human, so you think, oh, does that taint his godhood? And it does not, for that reason. Um, this letter is, uh, I read several things about the time and author, and uh, it seems to me that uh, there are some different options, but the one that I became most comfortable with was that it's written between 68 and 70 A.D., after Peter's death, before the destruction of the temple, for context. Interestingly, as we preach through Second Peter on Sunday mornings, there are a lot of similarities. In fact, uh, as Craig preached a week ago on Second Peter chapter 2, first three verses, and he'll be preaching again this next Sunday, the next four verses, I'll be calling upon him for input because it's uh, it's very similar material. So he might he might have an answer if I don't. Um, all right, so let's get started, and uh, I'm going to try to go through the first seven verses tonight. So let's read that. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called. Beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Father, thank you for your holy, inspired, infallible, and errant word. Thank you for your spirit, whereby we can hope to understand what you have written for us. We pray that you would attend our time tonight of study, that you would make clear to us 
the meaning of your word and that we would each find application in our own lives to walk away not just hearers only but to be changed and to do what it calls us to do and what it demands of us we pray in Jesus name Amen. Amen. Okay, so we know the author. We know he is describing himself, interestingly, as a servant of Jesus Christ. Anybody else have another word for servant in their version? Bond servant. Bond servant. Anybody know what the Greek word is for that? I got two choices. <laughs> Doulos. And uh, I always love pointing that out because when I was a freshman at USAFA, uh, the freshmen are called dooleys, little slaves. And the upperclassmen, they treat you as such. So I had a whole year of yes sir, no sir, at attention. You could only chew it seven times, then you had to swallow. Uh, you had to have a joke after every meal. You had to have three current events at the beginning of every meal. It was, uh, anyway. That's a sidetrack, but the word is doulos, or slave. And so Jude, instead of introducing himself as the half-brother of Jesus, he's introducing himself as a bondservant or a slave of Jesus Christ. So after his death, burial, and resurrection, Jude goes from uh, this familial relationship to one of worshiping his God and Creator. So what a change has occurred in the life of this man. Although he's not uh, considered an apostle, he is the brother of James, the apostle, uh, the writer of the book of James. And we see that as well in the first verse. So that's who is writing this letter. Questions or comments about that? Why isn't he considered an apostle? Why is he not? Um, well, that's a great question. I, I guess just because of the fact that he wasn't called and labeled as such by the Lord in his prerogative. Um, I think he certainly could have met the other qualifications. Uh, I, I don't know. Any, anything else you know of? Yeah, Sometime? and I'd even add that um, even in the beginning... You know, Jude starts a servant of Jesus Christ. James, his brother, starts his the same way, servant of Jesus Christ. And to your point, even even James, most <clears throat> people don't really have James on the apostle list either hmm. because they have the other James, James and John, the sons of Deb Zebedee, you know, one of the 12 disciples as an apostle. But if there's only 12 apostles, it's the 12 that we already know of. And a lot of them think it's Paul is an apostle because it says he is. And Matthias is not. So if you remember when Judas died in Acts, early Acts, they chose to replace him. Remember by Lot, they chose Matthias. And so they said he had been there with them the whole time. He kind of took the place of that 12, but really the apostleship, Paul took that spot. Um, so uh, so it's a whole big conversation of, yeah, thanks, we'll, Greg. we'll find out more when we get to when we get to heaven. So, but your point is, our answer is, because the Lord just, the Lord chose who he chose. His prerogative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, so that's the author of the letter. And then who is he writing the letter to? Those who are called. Um, interesting yet consistent descriptor in the New Testament writings uh, for the audience to which the scriptures are written. And so, who wants to give a shot at explaining who the called are? Us. Yeah, believers, all followers of Jesus. Believers. <clears throat> Those who have mm -hmm. been called by the Spirit. In, anytime, for some reason, anytime I, I come to a descriptor like that, I'm fascinated by it. Um, one, based upon my early understanding and then my transition of understanding throughout the years. And my favorite text to go to is John chapter 6 because it's, it displays such a big picture. It's got 52 verses in chapter 6. 
And if you start at the beginning, you see Jesus feeding 5,000. And some say that's just 5,000 males, doesn't include their family members. So thousands of people are with God, face to face. Remember, Jesus is the full representation of God. And they're looking him in the eyes. And they're seeing him do miracles. He's taking... Uh, uh, more fish than I usually get in a day, but not a lot of fish and not a lot of bread, and he's feeding all those people. Clear miracle. And then, in the second section, he's walking on water and uh, getting places without the normal means required, i.e. a boat. And so again, miraculous demonstration of his deity and his his ability and people are seeing this and experiencing this and then he goes into this discussion how he describes himself as the bread of life really explaining to them how he is the Messiah the promised one the prophesied one the Savior of the world and so from a human perspective I don't know that there's any better opportunity for someone to come to faith in Christ, for someone to follow the Lord Jesus, than to be there and experience firsthand, see with your own eyes, hear with your own ears, touch him, feel him, take some of his fish, watch his miracles, hear him clearly make no grammatical errors as he speaks words, the proper vocabulary word at the proper time to accurately describe who he is, Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. If you were going to be convinced to follow Jesus, it would have been every one of these people in this chapter. Uh, he, <laughs> no one can do better than him on anything he is God. He's there. He's dealing with them. But yet, you find down in verse 35 of John chapter 6, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But, verse 36, I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. He knew their hearts. They didn't believe. It wasn't because there wasn't some cool show going on with fireworks and miracles. It wasn't because he didn't speak their language. It wasn't because he didn't do a good job using the right words at the right time. It wasn't because it wasn't winsome or articulate or convincing. The next verse says, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. So he just told them, you don't believe. But the corollary to that is, but all that the Father gives me will come to me. They will believe. They will accept me as the bread of life. Verse 44, he says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I don't care if God himself is working miracles in front of your very eyes and telling you how to be saved, which is what happened in chapter 6. Jesus clearly says, not even that, not, in, not even interacting face-to-face -face with God himself is going to cause you to believe yep. and follow Christ. He says, what has to happen again? This is the second time he's saying it. Verse 44, the Father who sent me draws him. The Greek word for the word draw there is the one they use for lowering the rope with the pail, with the five-gallon bucket deep, deep into the well and hoisting th that thing up. <clears throat> Anybody lifted a five-gallon bucket full of water lately? How many pounds per gallon? Seven-ish? Seven, eight, eight times five? Forty pounds? It's not, a, um, it's not a gentle wooing, like God is drawing me, I'm whispering in the wind, is blowing, and he's drawing. It's an aggressive, but are you going to get this pail of water from the deep well? Yeah, it's going to take some serious energy and effort. So it's an aggressive verb there when it says God the Father draws him. 
Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Has, have these people heard and learned from Jesus, who is God? Yes. But if God, has a, if God the Father isn't opening their eyes to see and their ears to hear, they're not going to hear and they're not going to learn. Yep. And then I have to flip one more page because the chapter is so long to get over to yep. verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. We are described spiritually prior to conversion as dead, spiritually dead, meaning you have no spiritual capacities or abilities. And so that's why it makes sense that these people are experiencing Jesus in the flesh. They're seeing, hearing, touching, feeling. But it does them no good. The miracles that they're interacting with do them no good. Why? Because their spirit is dead. It is the capital S spirit who gives life. The Holy Spirit regenerates us and brings us to life spiritually. That's the only way. They, you don't get smart and figure out the gospel and decide, you know what, I am going to follow Jesus after all because you're educated and you understand the terms of the covenant. Verse 65, and he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Yep. You can't come to Christ unless it is granted to you by the Father. Now, you have two options. You can either say that God the Father grants the elect synonym for the called, which is the word we're tinging on right now, or God the Father grants it to everyone, which is universalism, and if he grants it to everyone, then everyone will be saved. But those are your only two options, and if you if you want to follow the scriptures, you're going to have to go with the first, which is the called. So, there we are. That's who it's to. To those who are called. Another descriptor for those that, has, that God has set his eternal affection on is beloved in God the Father. Beloved in God the Father. I'm reminded of Paul's words in Romans chapter 8. Uh, anybody have verses 38 and 39 memorized, or have they turned to it, and you want to read that for us? Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, as we contemplate, what does it mean to be loved by God the Father? What was the verse? Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. That is an all-inclusive, exhaustive list of potential things that could limit or cut off God the Father's love for you as one of the called as the bride of Christ. Now, you may be looking at those descriptors and say, well, life and death, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, you know, but it doesn't say anything about me personally. You know, maybe I could separate my, maybe I could do something, maybe I could sin, maybe I could rebel, maybe I could turn from the truth and lose my salvation and be separated from the love of God. But no, I would say that you're included because it says, nor anything else in all creation. Are you part of the creation? Yes. So you are included. Even you yourself cannot separate yourself yep. from God's love when he calls you. So when you talk about the perseverance of the saints, I, I like that description better, that, that the saints will persevere in their faith to the end. Not because they're strong or good athletes or, or anything that would credit themselves, but rather because of the love of God. Since God called them and God granted them, God secures them, God has loved them, nothing can separate them, nothing is more powerful than God himself. So it is a great encouragement, this truth, this teaching, about our salvation, how it originates, how it ends, the reasons why, it should produce in you a great thankfulness. 
a great thankfulness for what God has done for you in the Lord Jesus. And so we are thankful that um, we have these letters that are written to us. This letter is written to you because you are a believer. You're one of the called. You are, another scripture, beloved in God the Father, which encompasses so much and is such a great peace when you lay down at night and you're tempted by all the thoughts of what you have to do, the bills you have to pay. You wonder how that conversation is going to go tomorrow and you hate confrontation. But this is a great comfort. You are beloved in God the Father. Yep. Man, that, somehow that means everything's going to be okay. Just this simple fact. As, as Jude describes who you are as you listen and read his letter. You're not only beloved in God the Father, you are kept for, some versions say kept by, Jesus Christ kept for or kept by Jesus Christ. John chapter 10. Verses 27 and 28. Jesus, of course, is the good shepherd. And you, the called, well, you're one of his sheep. And so what does Jesus say? about that. John 10, 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Yeah. So, believer, you are kept for Jesus Christ. You are kept by Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 10. And so what a great encouragement that is. Craig, was that so stirring something in your mind? Yeah. Uh, two somethings, and I'll make them quick. But one is, when you go back to the beginning of chapter 10, um, he says in verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. As he's talking about the sheep hearing the voice, you know, so going exactly to the <coughs> calling, like, it won't happen uh, because... To everyone else, he, he is a stranger. Only his sheep will know his name. But then to, to piggyback on your point again back to the beginning of, of called and the elect, look where you were in verse 27. Just go the verse before that. Jesus is talking to the Jews there, and the Jews say, uh, if you are the Christ, a couple of verses up, then tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them and said, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do are in my Father's name bear witness about me. Here's the key. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. It's it's, um, it's, pretty, it's maybe pretty clear. difficult to believe, but it is not complex in terms of the sentence structure. Yeah. I'm reminded of our study recently on Sunday mornings in the book of 1 Peter and how that book opens up where Peter is describing you. He, he uses the term to those who are elect in verse 1 of, of that book, uh, that letter. But in verse 5, he's talking about you who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, yeah. again, just emphasizing that you, beloved, are kept for Jesus Christ, and it's not dependent upon how good of a day you had today. Roman Catholicism does not emphasize this doctrine, this truth. They worry every night if they are going to sleep with some unconfessed sin that's going to ruin it for them. What a miserable way. What, what, a, what a miserable idea of salvation. In fact, that's no salvation at all. There's no comfort in that. But there is great com comfort in the, in the true salvation that Christ bought for us, that God because he loved Christ, redeemed a bride for his son, the church, those of faith throughout all generations, called out ones. In fact, that's what the Greek word for church means, the called out ones. I forgot about that. So that's who you are. That's who he is. That's who you are. That's who he's talking to. Any questions or comments on those facts? 
it's kind of interesting to me because one of the <clears throat> things I get asked by most people is, can you lose your salvation? And this is a really clear thing saying you can't. Mm. Which right. is awesome, you know. The Bible. It is awesome because if you're if you look in the mirror and you start examining your life, no wonder why everybody has a doubt or a question like, I don't, I'm missing the mark here. I'm coming up short. Yeah, <laughs> My GPS numbers are slightly off. Yeah, it's a common question. Everybody's got it. But that's why you got to combat the error with the truth. you got to always go to the Word and say, yeah, it really doesn't matter what I think or feel. It really matters what the Scriptures say. So let me change my stinking thinking. Yep. Let my mind be transformed, the rene renewing of your mind. What verse is that, Jason? I know you know. <laughs> you were just Romans, talking to me about it this week. I, I don't know the verse. Romans, Romans 12, 12, verse 2. Um, yes, so you're right, Pete. Verse 2. His hope for you, his prayer for you, for us, Christian community. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Somebody give me a short definition of mercy. Don't give Jesus. somebody a break. Jesus and I could kill him. Giving somebody a break. Hurt him worse, or, and you don't. So, in other words, you're not giving them what they deserve. Right. Mercy. Not getting what you deserve or giving someone a break, as Dan said. Same thing. May mercy be upon you. Peace. I mean, that's what everybody's after, right? Peace. Everybody wants peace. I think of John chapter 14. Verse 27, <clears throat> Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. <clears throat> Every day <laughs> you have opportunity to put into practice John chapter 14, verse 27. Every day thoughts cross your mind that trouble you. Every day, situations occur where you are tempted, or you, you're tempted to to be afraid and, and to to be troubled, to be concerned, to be anxious, to worry. And Jesus' words to you and I are: Don't be. You are at peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's got this. He's got you. He's got them. Everybody wants to sing the song. He's got the whole world in his hands. But we forget that. Jesus is reminding us, and Jude is praying that we would grab hold of that truth and be reminded of that, and that peace would be multiplied in our lives. And love. Love covers a multitude of sins. We're supposed to love one another as God has loved us supposed to have a special love and care for brothers and sisters in Christ. Can I ask a question? Of course. It's something I've been thinking about for a long time. I was Catholic. You know, they always, peace be with you, peace be with you. You always hear that all the time. And the one verse I always come to is, because everything says peace, except Matthew, which says, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I came to bring a sword to divide. Because I hear everybody preaching all over the world now, the country's so divided and we need, you know, we got to end this division. And I'm thinking, you don't get it. Jesus is here to divide. Hmm. Am I wrong? I mean, I'm, I'm asking. I really am. This has it's been two me different for things. Years. Yep. There's two different things we're talking about here. Okay. okay. We're talking about an internal peace, personally, and oh. with God. Okay. Not peace in terms of. Uh, a lack of conflict peace. or a lack of war in the world. Um, yeah. Okay. It, obviously, was, yeah, Jesus' me words are 100% correct. Oh, no, and I'm so not he, he, doubting that. I just, he, it's he does cause division. The truth divides. 
Absolutely. But even in the midst of earthly conflict, you can have peace in your soul. A, knowing that your account has been settled with the maker of God and you're no longer under his righteous judgment and wrath. And then B, you can be at peace because you know sovereign God is working all things together for his glory and your good. So even in this difficult trial and tribulation, which is normal to, to, to sweat a little bit about, internally, you can be at peace yeah. because of those facts. Good question. That takes us through verse 2. Any comments or questions? Other? Verse 3. Beloved, again, we know what that means. Although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, so his first notion, his first idea was mm -hmm. to, to have a positive letter, rejoicing, being excited about uh, this wonderful thing that we share in common, our salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I found it necessary to write to you appealing to you, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. What does that make you think of, that, that second phrase there? I found it necessary to write <laughs> about a different subject. How did he find it necessary to write about a different topic? Mm -hmm. <coughs> right, why didn't he write what he wanted to write? He's saying, hey, I wanted to write to you about this, but I'm not. What do we call that? In scripture. What's the source of scripture? How does scripture get written? By God's divine inspiration. Second Timothy three sixteen says God breathed. And so, yeah, looking back, we know what's going on with Jude. He wants to write about common salvation, but the Spirit of God says, Nope, that's not the letter you're gonna write. Here's the message I have. Remember when Paul and Acts said, hey, I want to come see you guys, but the Spirit of God wouldn't allow it. Had to go this way instead. And so it should be with us. We should seek to walk by the Spirit. You know, we're commanded to walk by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. To be in such close fellowship with God. Left foot, right foot. Whichever way you want me to go, Lord. It says to pray without ceasing. So we're to always be in communication with God. And we're to walk by His Spirit, the same Spirit that Jude had, we have. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. We looked at, in John 6, it's the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit of God that saves us. And so, this is normal Christian life, where you and your humanity, you, have, you think, well, I'm a, this is what I'm going to wake up, I'm going to do today. But then you find yourself going somewhere else, doing something else. And we pray that the Spirit of God is leading us, guiding us, directing us to do whatever He wants to do. I mean, yes, I have a plan, but but I'm always holding today with an open hand. Yep. Here's what I'm putting in. Here's my jelly beans that I'd like to go eat today. But God, if you want to take this one out and give it to this person or knock them all out of my hand and pick up something else, that's your prerogative. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. So... I'm, I'm your doulos. I'm your slave. We're not going to do only what I want to do today. We're to live for Christ. And so Jude is, is living that out. And uh, he's being faithful to give what the Spirit of God is laying on his heart and mind, which is to contend for the faith. Um, does, does somebody else have another word besides contend or, or a modifier to contend? Like earnestly contend for? That's what I got, earnestly oh, contend yeah, that's for what the faith. Like earnestly contend. So it's a strenuous description, almost like an athletic competition. I think of Adam's comment few weeks ago describing Pete riding down the old road on his bike working hard for his money earnestly contending exerting energy and effort 
And that's what Jude is calling us to as saints, as believers, to earnestly contend for the faith. When you think of a, uh, the faith, I want you to think simp in, in the most simplest terms is the gospel. And when you think about the simple message of the gospel, and you think about what we recently came through on Monday nights in 1 Corinthians, what chapter and, and three or four verses come to your mind that succinctly articulated the necessary aspects of the gospel? It's in the teens, chapter-wise. This is a we lot. We spent several weeks in it. It's not that long ago. Everybody turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because you need to see it once again. <laughs> you need to be reminded what yeah. is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And then somebody read me the first four verses. Don't be shy. I'll read it. <clears throat> this guy's got it. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach, preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you, you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that, that which I also received, how that how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Bam. Stuck it. Paul says, here's the gospel. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. There you have it. So that is at the center, at the core of, quote, the faith. That is what we are to contend for. That is primary doctrine. There is no wiggle room on that. There is no compromise on that. As you think through the five souls, we find out in Scripture alone that we're saved by, by faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. This is central to our Christian faith. It was once for all delivered to the saints. It's not changing. It is the deposit that Paul spoke of when he talked to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 starting verse 10 and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, a teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he's able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, Guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So, that applies to us as well. We are to guard the good deposit entrusted to us. That good deposit is the faith once we're all delivered to the saints. That faith is the gospel. The fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He lived a perfect righteous life. He died, he was buried, he rose again on the third day to the glory of God the Father. This is central to our existence. This is central to our mission. If you were there or listened to the sermon this Sunday, you remember that Jesus said, I came to seek and save that which was lost. Mm -hmm. And then his high priestly prayer, he said, Just as you, Father, have sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. Our mission is to seek and save the lost. Our vehicle, our instrument, what we use to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit is the gospel that we are articulating. Jude says, I find it necessary to write appealing, another strong word, appealing to you, 
earnestly contend this is not some hobby. <laughs> Monday night Bible study is not a once a week hobby uh, that you like to do, like playing pickleball. And, uh, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. This is all in all. This is everything. This is, this is why you exist. This is how you glorify God. By living for Him and being a light to the world and guarding the faith, sharing the faith, proclaiming the faith, protecting the faith. And why is it necessary for us to speak of the truth of the gospel in these vocabulary words? He says in verse 4, he gives us a reason. For certain people have crept in unnoticed. What do you think mm -hmm. is more dangerous in warfare? The line of red coats in front of you, blazingly obvious, or that guy, or is that a guy? I can't tell. I mean, is that a bush, or is that a guy in a ghillie suit? That's the guy. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Which one? Which one's gonna get you? The one you're not expecting. Yeah, yeah, the one you're not respecting, the one you're not looking for, the one, the one you don't see. I mean, you're not preparing for the one you don't see. You're preparing for the obvious. Anybody, most people, can do that. But you got to be super vigilant. Why do you think Russia had the KGB? Why do you think we have the CIA? Why don't we just have a standing army? Call it good. There are other means of warfare that most of the time are much more effective. And so in the church, here we find that certain people have crept in unnoticed. Crept in. Isn't that a sneaky phrase? It speaks of the deceptive and deceitful nature. It speaks of the camouflage to go unnoticed, like, you don't even know I'm here. Mm -hmm. Heather calls it my Santa suit when I spearfish. I have a red, red and black camoed suit that I wear. I do look like Santa. I got a little extra weight. He does wear a lot of red. That's not why I wear it. You remember the visible spectrum of light from school? Roy G. Biv? What's that first one in the wavelength R stand for? Red? Red. Red is the first color to disappear at depth. And so I am trying to creep in unnoticed and shoot that grouper in the face. Yep. <laughs> if I come all in there like a clown, I mean, he's out of there. He knows better. But if I put the sneak on him, then I can get close enough to do deadly damage. So we find here, certain people have crept into the church unnoticed. Yep. And that's probably got to be for a couple of reasons. One, because of their energy and efforts to be unnoticed. And the other side of that coin is the lack of energy and effort yep. on the saints' parts to be diligent, to be sober, looking for the adversary, who Satan himself has described as a roaring lion, wandering about seeking whom he might devour. The battle is real. The warfare is on. Just because you're tired doesn't mean, oh, time out on the field. Jimmy's tired. No tax today. Yeah. Truce. No, there is no mm. such thing. It's always game on. Whether you're on the field or on the sideline, whether you're injured or healthy, whether you feel like it or not, whether it's day or night, the battle wages. And so Jude says, urging you, I'm appealing to you to contend earnestly for the faith. Why? Because there are enemies. 
there are enemies of the faith who are trying to sneak in unnoticed. Let me ask you, think about, okay, we want to be prepared. So, where do we look? Where could someone creep in unnoticed? How could they get to us? How could they exert influence? Where would they do it? How, what medium would they use? Give me some examples. It could, it could be um, religious leaders that the sheep would look up to, but they're not preaching directly from the word. They have hidden agendas. Absolutely. So you've got preachers behind the pulpit. Okay. Where else could a false teacher interject false doctrine and untruth? Through what other venues? Through the pulpit? By clearly just, I'm a preacher and I'm proclaiming to you on God's behalf what he says and, and they're lying about it. They do it from the pulpit. Where else do they do it? Okay, from the pews in the congregation, they could be whispering. You know, I noticed uh, Brian said this about, but I don't think that's really the case. Don't you agree? What about some books? TV. <clears throat> huh? TV. TV. Media. The internet. The what, media. The media. What, what, what blog are you reading? Hmm. What, what input are you taking into your mind? What's, what's shaping your thinking? Yep. What are you spending your hours of, of screen time on? What are you ingesting into your system? Are they nutrients, vitamins, minerals, or is it poison, toxins, toxins deadly viruses? Look. Who doesn't recognize the best-selling book, Your Best Life Now? I mean, I don't have to read it. I know the scriptures. From a human perspective, they don't talk about me having my best life now. Dan just got through quoting Jesus saying, yeah, when I come in and, and uh, you become my follower, it's going to be a lot of trouble for you. It's going to cause division. And Jesus said, okay, I'm the master. If they treat me this way, how do you think they're going to treat the followers? What they do to the master? He, he healed people. He saved people. He was kind, gentle, never said the wrong word. And how did they respond? Crucify him! So, how do you think they're going to treat you on this life, in this life, this side of heaven? If you're acting like Jesus, doing what you're supposed to do, being a little Christ, representing him, sharing the faith, contending for the faith, saying, no, this is the truth. No, God doesn't say your best life is now. Oh, you miserly Scrooge, you don't, you don't want me to be happy. My God wants me to be happy. My God doesn't want me to be sick. My God wants me to be rich. Well, that's not the one true God. And you're not going to make any friends with that book. Book. I heard myself say that twice. <laughs> Must be true. <laughs> okay, so we got to know where are these people going to be sneaking in, creeping in. Because they've gone unnoticed in the past. Let's not let them go unnoticed in the present. Let's prep, let's prepare, let's wake up. The battle is real. As he continues to describe these people, uh, he says, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Mm -hmm. He's going to go through some examples of the consistency of God to, content, to condemn and contend with evil and how God will condemn the evil among us. A lot of times we wish he would do it sooner. <laughs> He's much more patient than us. But remember, God operates outside of the sphere of time. And so we understand, and, and so does Jude, that uh, 
you know, they're they're the enemy. They're they're wreaking havoc. They're doing damage, but they're not going to get away with that. They will get what they deserve. I have written down here Second Corinthians eleven fourteen and fifteen. <clears throat> What does it say? And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. So both aspects of that, both, both aspects in that, yeah, it's a great tactic to look like a fish when you want to shoot one in the head. So they're comfortable swimming with you. Yeah, so it's a great tactic if you're a servant of the devil to look like a sheep instead of a wolf. Wolf, people see a wolf, they cry wolf. Oh, you're just another dumb sheep? Yeah, come on in, I'll hang out with you. So they, they look like a preacher. They have a pulpit. They have a book they're open. They're exciting. They're passionate. They're telling stories. They're entertaining. Man, yeah, and they even make sense to a certain degree from a human perspective. I could be talked into the fact that God loves me and he wants a bunch of good things for me. But again, as Paul says, and Jude says the same thing, they will receive their reward, which is punishment. It is condemnation. Now he starts to describe their character. He says they're ungodly ungodly people if you hear somebody trying to teach you something but their life is ungodly that should be a warning sign for you they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality so what does that mean what is somebody remind me what grace is definition If mercy is not getting what you deserve, grace is getting what you don't deserve. It's the opposite. And so we get forgiveness from God. And so these ungodly people will take that notion, that teaching, and say, Oh, well, since we're just for, we're forgiven of everything, let's just go ahead and do everything. Let's take advantage of this free gas. Burn it while you got it. You know, burn through this tank, old dad will buy us another tank. We just use it all up. This is a good deal. Getting what we deserve, don't deserve. Getting something that we don't deserve. Grace. And so they, they pervert it. They abuse it. And ultimately they deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The ruler, our owner. They deny him. How so? Through their actions. Certainly, but if you listen carefully through their words, through their false teachings, if they're saying something that is unbiblical, they are denying what the scripture says. That is their behavior, that is their description, that is how they get in. And so now he's going to give us three examples by way of reminder. But before I get to that verse 5, let me pause and ask are there any questions or comments? So let me ask you how do you validate or invalidate somebody's words or somebody's teaching? Specifically. See, that's, that's a good question, Brian. I was thinking the same exact thing when you were, you were speaking. You know, if you're listening to a false teacher, the default answer would be to go to the Bible to verify what he's preaching is correct. But then it takes you to the next level. How do you know that the Bible that you're studying is the correct Bible? Um, 
I don't know that I fully understand the question, but if we're talking about, uh, I mean, you're not simply asking a question of, are you using Adam's favorite translation, the message? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's, uh, you so had that coming, Adam, because you've used that joke on me so many times. Word, me too. Yeah, <laughs> right back. I'm rubber. Your glue bounce off me, sticks to you. Um, are, you're not talking about what translation of the Bible we're using, right? Correct. Yeah, that's right. What, what are you? What? What are you saying? Are you uh, when you're asking the question? Am I preaching from the correct Bible? Say I'm home. And a Jehovah's Witness knocks on my door mm. and you say, well, your preaching is not what I follow. And he says, well, in my Bible, yeah. this is what it says. OK, I got you. Yeah. So that's a good distinction. And, and uh, we find other cults uh, like like Mormons. It would be another example who would be comfortable using certain scriptures to talk about with you. But then they would also bring in the Book of Mormon. And so you're right. Uh, we do have throughout the ages of Christendom, a canon of scripture that we recognize. And uh, there are some other religious books out there, even called the Bible, that, but when you open them up, <laughs> their chapter and verses are a little bit different than ours. And so, yes, wow. uh, you do need to be on guard and, and careful and a good study, a good steward of the faith. And so... That's varsity level right there. Thank you. The basic level is we're validating the teaching from the scriptures in general. And then we're also validating through the actions as well, right? And so you hear some of these teachers say some things and you're like, oh, it could be true. I, I, there's possibly in a sense where that could be true. But then you see their actions that they are taking the money you're sending into their ministry and they're buying a, a Gulfstream 4. And you're like, hmm, wonder if that's appropriate stewardship of money. And they're, they're living in an eight kajillion dollar house. And you're like, hmm, wonder if that's beyond necessary. And so you see their actions in their lifestyle, and do they equate to the teaching of, teachings of the Scripture? And that's another way, another clue to assess the situation and assess the teacher. So validating words by their actions, validating their teachings according to the Scriptures. Um, something I find that I run into often um, <clears throat> whenever the topic of Christ or God or church or anything um, comes up it's I feel like it's a certain kind of a defense mechanism for people um, to to use just that um, you know against you know I don't believe in religion you know I believe in God you know I'm a good person I you know I always I never lie you know I help out old ladies across the they street. just lied but yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> but you know, and but I don't believe in religions because these people, you know, they just are just out for money. You know, what I mean, yeah. I, I'm offended by it, and and it's harsh. You know, what I mean, that's pretty harsh because it's a harsh generalization. Yes, it's unfair. Exactly. It's a, it's not valid. Right. It's what they're comfortable to push off the conversation and it's, to say it's I don't want to talk about that. Justifies I don't care. their view. There's yeah. So many people that that. And and they you know I don't and I believe that yes they probably in their heart believe that they're doing the right thing and they probably are good people you know for that reason and that's that their belief is but you know in my in my head when, and without trying to say anything offensive back to them or anything like that you know what I mean I'm just in my head I'm thinking man you got it all wrong you know what I mean like yeah but you know we're called to fellowship we're called to you know, be sanctified and learn the, the gospel, and, and how are you going to do that without going to church and, and you know, surrounding yourself by people? Yeah, you should just tell them like -minded. To, to stop worshiping people and stop worshiping God. Stop caring so much about people. Start caring about God and His Word. Right. If you do care about God and you do love God as you say, you'll read His Word, and then Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll do what I say. And there's a lot of instructions 
in God's word that you supposedly love that you're not doing, so I don't believe you. You say you love God, but you're lying to yourself. And and that's def- that's offensive, and right. that causes division. <laughs> but but no, God but says, hey, the truth is the truth. I'm not, I'm not saying it to make you mad. Offensive. I'm just saying it because it's truth. Yep. And I didn't make it up. I can't help it. Sometimes I wish I didn't have to be this messenger of truth. And yes, there are ways that you can do it that are less offensive than others. But at the end of the day, some truths are just offensive because they're offensive. Because the light exposes the darkness and the dar- yeah. darkness doesn't appreciate yeah. Exposure. That's right. That could be just yeah. what the people need is to be able yeah. to it is what they need. It is for the sure truth. what they yeah. need. Yeah. It's no and even if you do it correctly, it's no guarantee that they're going to respond in the sure. moment, but that's not up to you. Why? Because you already went through the scriptures tonight to determine it doesn't matter if you did a miracle and walked on the water in front of them, they're not going to follow right. you and believe. It's it, you don't that's not your that's role. Not that's role, the Spirit right? of God's role. You do your role, which is to contend for the faith. This is what's truth. I know it's truth because this is what it says in the Scriptures. That's what contending is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Being so we're given to this. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'll just keep going. You know, it's like I think Craig said the other day, you know, there's believers and there's unbelievers. That's it. Right? There's no, I'm kind of, sort of, between a believer and a non-believer, you know. I'm having a problem with people out there, and when we talk about defending the faith, God, or I'm not going to state, but I'm going to ask. God doesn't want us to take crap from people, right? If they're saying, you know, God's a bunch of crap, and blah, 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 blah. I feel like, as a human being, as a man, or whatever, just as a guy, that I want to defend it and say, you know, shut up. I don't want to hear this crap. Because I've got a guy right now telling me I'm in a cult and all this crap. And, and I've known him a long time, so I'm trying to be nice and say, hey, man, you know, you can believe whatever you want to believe. But then I'm thinking, no. You know, I need to be able to stand up and say, this is what I am, and that's it. I, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm in a weird place yeah, two, with that. Two what aspects you're talking to about. I, you have customers you probably get. If I get people, I just like, you know, happened to yesterday. I know. It's, happened, it's been happening to me a lot. And, yeah. and, and, and you don't want to be mean to somebody, but at the same time, I don't want them walking well, no, over God no or me. There's no but to that. Right. You are not to be mean to someone. Period. Well, no, I know. Jesus said, uh, if they punch you on this side of the face, give them the other side of the face. They mm-hmm. take your coat, give them your shirt. So, does God call us to be abused by people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, are we to return evil for evil? Absolutely not. No, no not are, are we to speak evil, the but... truth in love? Absolutely yes. And so, so I evil understand. Evil will come because of that. Yeah. Absolutely yes, it will. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand your frustration from a human perspective yeah. and your desire to punch someone in the throat. No, no, it's not. But, I mean, but you know, not that's not authorized. The there, that's not I'm authorized just... use of force. That's <laughs> right, not but, in the but, description but, of earnestly <laughs> contend for the faith. We're to earnestly contend for the faith with, with the truth of the think... scriptures and a loving heart, right. praying all the time that God would do what only He could do to this person who. It's not that they hate me. They hate Christ. They're right, in rebellion yeah. against the God That's who the created them. They want to worship themselves and not humbly submit to the Lord Jesus, whom I represent. And so, of course, their anger is coming out to me, but it's really directed to him, and that's what I've been called to, suffer for the cause of Christ. That's what it's all about. And so you suffer gladly. I'm so glad I get to share in the sufferings of Christ because my master did this. I'm supposed to follow and be like him. So I will gladly take your insults. I will gladly take the shame you're dishing out to me and, and not deny my Lord and Savior and not back down on the fact that Jesus is the tr- way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Quoting scripture, loving, praying for, forgiving them, just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven me. So yes, you are to contend for the faith. Yes, you are to stand up for the truth. No, you're not to do it in an earthly, humanly manner of, you know, stand by for knowledge that's going to occur at the end of my bat. You know, and when you wake up, you'll see things more clear. That's not authorized. No, no, I'm not, yeah. you missed my point. I was, uh, I, I was just yeah. saying, but I would think God would want me to defend him. Yes. Jesus would blaze with anger when the interests of God were threatened. And so do I, quite frankly. Yeah. Yeah, we could spend another night talking about righteous anger. And so yeah. I, I didn't mean to misunderstand yeah, you. Yeah, agree and do not sin. My point would be yeah. the same either way, as I described yeah. no, how, no, no, how we would show appropriately content for the faith. But to yes. Is we would have them, have them do to us and then just pray for them that, that they see the light and then let God do the rest. That's about all you can do. 
God, I'm always comfortable leaving things in God's hand, speaking the truth, and yeah. letting God do what only He can do. Yeah. Well, Craig, uh, what you want me to do? Say 59. Yeah, we're good. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't accomplish my assignment. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a simple task: go through the first seven verses. <laughs> It was good, man. That's all right, good. because now, so time. now next week, I'll end short and we'll put it all at the end. I'm Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I see him laughing on mute. <laughs> I've heard him saying something like, it rolls downhill. Yeah, exactly. Uh, me and old Mr. Gravity. Well, good. I appreciate fine. your... I should have gone first. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's always the case. You should always go first. Yeah. I'll suck up the mushy middle. I'm fine with that. Yeah. It's basically going to be a repeat of your Texas next That's week. That's right. Anyway. That's right. Um, I'm going to be preaching on it on Sunday. So yeah. you're getting a double dose next week, Sunday and Monday, same thing, bang, bang. All right. Uh, it's 9 o'clock. You're free to leave. As you're free to leave, does anybody have any questions or comments they want to talk about? I just got one comment. No, it's that you're either for God or against him. You know, like, I'm kind of religious and I'm like, okay with God, but I don't really right. believe in any of the Bible. And right. So those guys, it's like, you know. Or you could do it. I believe in God, but this Jesus thing is, mm -hmm. Well, you know, you're incorrect because you're either for Jesus, right. who is God, or you're against him. That's yeah. all i got to say, you know, that's it. It is simple. And then punch him. And you don't... <laughs> no, no, Pete, no! And you really just never know when, you know what God's plan is for those people, you know, uh -huh. will he touch their heart, will he prick their heart and change them at some point along yeah. the line down the road, who knows? Mm -hmm. you, know? you don't know, and it doesn't really matter. Yeah. All you know is what his plan for you is, and that is to love him with the love of Jesus that you've been loved with and share with him the truth. Mm -hmm. And if you ever are stumbling on what was the truth I was supposed to contend for, you know, oh yeah, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4 articulates mm -hmm. those simple points. If I ever forget them, I can always flip there. I used to be. I was just. My church doesn't like browbeat you about money, but I just really like give my money every about. week because you yeah. got to turn the lights on, you know. Oh, yeah. God, for God, what they teach me. Yeah. 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 And and not to mention, God calls me to support His kingdom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But my finances. How yeah. can yeah. Even if they are jack tarts down there. Hey, Zoom guys, uh, what's up? You guys want to talk about anything? Yeah. Everybody good. Thanks, thanks for joining us tonight. Good to see you. Jim looks like he's going to say something, but he's just smiling there. <laughs> All right. Thank you for